More than 20 years ago, when I began to work in forensic psychology, pictures of real individuals and real children were used to assess sexual preferences uh, among sex offenders. These pictures were seized by police force from pedophiles, and they were lent to us uh, in labs to, uh, for forensic purposes. At some point, uh, the government banned this kind of use for obvious ethical reasons. Uh, these were real individuals showed to real sex offenders, so it was a bit tricky, as you may understand. But that led me to the idea that uh, we may use uh, synthetic virtual characters to do the same job, to assess sexual preferences. Uh, so we developed a series of 3D synthetic characters, and we used them in virtual immersion. That is, we placed uh, sex offenders in virtual immersion with uh, virtual characters to see how uh, the patients uh, would react to, to these. But first, what is uh, virtual reality? What is immersive virtual reality? It is about a set of technologies that are used to place someone uh, in immersion with realistic images. And the goal to achieve is presence. Presence is the feeling to be, of being somewhere else than we really are. And presence is the effect that is sought by using virtual reality. What you see there is uh, an immersive vault, the, the vault that we have at the Quebec University in Utahway, where I teach, and why I co-direct this lab with my colleague Stéphane Bouchard. Um, obviously, virtual reality can lead to almost an infinity of possibilities. Uh, and among these possibilities, yes, of course, there is sexuality. And for those who follow the, the activities over the internet, uh, we have assisted uh, at the booming of virtual si of, of sites uh, 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 virtual porn or uh, sex like real. These sites offer the possibility uh, to experiment at the first person stance sexual encounters with synthetic sexual playmate. So you can uh, have this kind of virtual relationship and further if affinities. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, of course, it's, it's a serious matter because, according to MarketWatch, such VR porn content is expected to be $1 billion in 2025. So just behind gaming and uh, uh, sport-related content. But to be, to be fair, uh, such uh, use of art and technology to depict sexuality is not new. In fact, it dates back to uh, the prehistorical ages. Um, when we look at the Paleolithic caves, uh, we can see a lot of sexual content represented. And I can easily imagine um, these prehistorical folks uh, experimenting the immersion in the cave using oil lamps and feeling present to these sexual paintings and low relief. You know, uh, being present to that sexuality was most probably the first kind of virtual sexuality. And interestingly, according to um, scholars such as David Lewis Williams, who is an expert in that field, um, the representation of sexual arousal in these, in these caves are metaphors of altered states of consciousness um, sleeps and dreams. I don't know if that's true, but even in my worst nightmare, I wouldn't have sex with these kind of characters. Monsters having sex with humans or childlike um, characters in anti. These kind of sexual content now can be found over the internet, and according to um, researchers in my field, and I concur with them, uh, this may well be a part of the shaping of the future paraphilias, or sexual deviancies, if you prefer. Paraphilias is the technical terms for sexual deviancies. So, the use of these kind of uh, synthetic pornography, because of the different variants that are uh, displayed and because of uh, the oddity of it, can have a major impact on the development of sexuality in children and 
teenagers and lead to new form of paraphilias such as sexual sadism, voyeurism, uh, and pedophilia, or even other paraphilias that we don't know yet. Assessing paraphilias or sexual deviancies is that we do at the Virtual Reality Application in Forensic Psychiatry Lab, which is a unique lab in a sense because it is uh, located in a maximum security uh, psychiatric uh, hospital in Montreal. And uh, we have as a mission the assessment and research about violent offenders suffering from major uh, uh, health problems, uh, severe uh, uh, health problems, uh, psychiatric health problems. And uh, uh, we assess on a regular basis uh, people presenting rape problem or uh, pedophilia. And uh, these people are getting to, the, to our lab because of a ju judiciary process. They are there to be assessed uh, in the sentencing process. Uh, our research are sponsored by the Canadian and the Quebec governments, and we are a part of an international network working in that field. To assess sexual preferences, we need some specialized tool. And one of these tools is what we call the penile plethysmograph, a fancy term to talk about a simple tool to assess a simple response that is sexual erection or a sexual tumor sense, if you prefer. Even today, after 60 years of, of using, this is this, the gold standard in the, in the field of uh, sexual preferences assessment, according to the ATSA organization, which is the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. So this is what we use in the lab to, uh, to draw profiles of sexual response. And we, we worked with that plethysmograph tool combined with virtual reality. In fact, this is one of the major advances that we, we made in the field. And what we find so far is that pedophile or child molesters, if you prefer, show a very distinct profile of sexual arousal when they are immersed with the virtual characters depicting uh, child features. They are strongly attracted and they react strongly at the sexual level to, these, to the presence of these avatars depicting uh, prepubescent uh, features. And we have the exact, the ex the exact opposite with the, uh, the non-deviant individual when they are shown adults. We also use what we call eye tracker. We built in uh, the Google VR uh, glasses, we built in uh, infrared tracker to probe into uh, the perspective of uh, the person that is assessed. So we can be with him in his visual perspective and see with him what he sees when he's immersed in virtual reality. We are literally in his visual perspective to get the feel of his experience uh, with the virtual character. And furthermore, using the same technology, we found that pedophile subject were showing specific scan path, specific ways to, to uh, deal with the information, to treat mentally the information. So specific sexual arousal and specific mental processes. And these results are uh, similar to those find by, uh, found by my friend and colleague Peter Fromberger in Germany and by Og and Perkins in England. So, Eye tracking is useful to control for the procedure, to make sure the procedure is, is valid, that it is respected by the guy that is assessed, and at the same time is the source of information about sexual preferences also. So, to uh, recap about the virtual characters, we develop these using a specific software from which we can choose parameters and decide the color of the eyes, the type of complexion, uh, the color of the ears, the age. So we build you know, characters according to sexual preferences specific to uh, groups of offenders. And then we output these characters and use them uh, to, uh, we, in fact, we insufflate specific behavior to them using motion capture. Here you can see Sarah Michel Neveu, one of my PhD students in this, one of his preferred suits. Um, 
And then we put the patient in immersion with the virtual character, and at the same time, we measure uh, uh, the penile response, the eye tracking response, and the brain response. Okay? The trick is th there is to triangulate on the sexual preferences using a set of measurements that will uh, point toward what we call sexual preferences. As for the, uh, the brain responses, what we find so far, what we found so far is that uh, uh, pedophile subjects have a specific brain activation patterns when they are shown uh, avatars depicting child characteristics. Essentially, we found similar results than a French group led by Serge Tolleru in France, uh, another led in Germany by uh, Ponsetti, another one in the United States by uh, uh, Kent Keel and Carla Arensky, uh, and another in Canada by James Cantor. So, what we know now is that specific sexual arousal, specific way to deal with the information, and specific brain activation. Okay, we have a specific pattern of asymmetry in brain activation that is specific, that is particular to the, the sex offenders dealing with, with uh, child victims, and we have the exact opposite pattern of activation, a non-deviant individual facing adult character. So we have something like a signature there about sexual deviancies. And what, what we found also is that this same brain pattern that we found is correlated with sexual presence. So the fact that the immersion seems more real to someone is associated with uh, this same brain pattern. So there's something there to boost the, the experience of being present to uh, a sexual simulation. As a related topics in our lab, we also work on psychopathy. Psychopathy is characterized by lack of empathy, okay, by emotional coldness or what we call also callousness. It's the fact that you may not be able to experiment what someone is experimenting, experimenting in front of you by the feeling expressed by the others. Psychopathy is closely related to sexual offense and sexual deviance. In fact, when we have someone who is at the same time uh, sexual deviant and psychopath, we have the worst combination. We have someone that is really dangerous, and knowing these two sources of information is one of the best ways to predict uh, the recidivism, predict the level of risk or, or dangerousness caused by the individual. What we've done to study uh, empathy in psychopaths is that we developed this set of animation uh, representing people expressing pain, and we immersed high and low psychopathic individuals with these animation. And we measured their brain response. And we obtained very different profile with high and low psychopathic individuals. With high psychopathic individuals, we essentially got a flat profile, no brain response according to the, the pain expressed by the character. With the low psychopathic individual, we have a clear drop in the brain response, something that is about their process in trying to feel and understand what the, the virtual agent, the character in front, was expressing. So we have, so far, two markers, two very interesting markers, one of sexual deviancies, as we have seen previously, and this one about a lack of empathy. So I think that's, that's a great advance uh, for the assessment of sexual deviancy, but also I think that using this set of measurement will help us to build, hopefully, new devices to treat uh, sexual deviancy. Okay? We already know that we can treat anxiety disorders and other psychological problems using virtual reality. That's what one of my colleagues is doing uh, with anxiety uh, back in Canada. But uh, I think that in the future, maybe in five or ten years from now, we'll be able to deal with some of the brain activity related to sexual deviancy, such as pedophilia, and help these guys better control their response. Not, not necessarily cure them, I don't believe in that, but help them, help them to control some of the responses related to their sexual deviancy, because they may, uh, they may be doing inhuman things, I still think that we have to deal with them humanly. So to conclude, I will say that VR technology are there for the better and the worst. That is, paradoxically, the same set of technology that may contribute to the shaping of sexual deviancy in the futures are, will also be there to help 
deal with the latter. Thank you.